Welcome to the Center for Universal Oneness. We are an open, welcoming, spiritual community that supports all faith traditions and invites you to join us on your spiritual journey. We host different speakers each week to guide and inspire us. We are guided by universal principles of acceptance of all that is sacred, and we strive to live in the oneness of love. Please enjoy this presentation. Jane Simmons with us uh, this morning. And so after enlightenment, the laundry, and I really can't wait to hear what it is you have to say uh, to us, but just real quick, let's take a moment to consume some of Jane's background, some of what she uh, is or has done to get her to this point so that she can be uh, with us. Um, and books, a uh, great deal of experience, over 20 years, um, different churches. So that's kind of neat that you've experienced some different things. And in the prelude to getting started, uh, we found out even little bits more about the richness of her life. Jane, take, uh, take the next 30 minutes or so and tell us what you have for us, please. Well, thank you, Mark. I appreciate um, all of you for being here. I'm so delighted to be with you today, to be invited back um, on this Sunday after Easter, which is such a powerful time of year such a poignant time for us. But, you know, this, many of us celebrated the Easter story last week, this time of renewal and rebirth and rising up. And you know, an ancient ceremony that originally was uh, on the return of the, the spring, celebrating the return of the spring after the long winter of dormancy and apparent death, new life appears. So this story of overcoming, being entombed in suffering for, in some way, and then victoriously rising up and uh, getting beyond it is not an unfamiliar one with us. It's not an unfamiliar story. In fact, it is actually embedded in our cultural um, and universal mythology, what uh, Joseph Campbell dubs the hero's journey what I call the heroic journey. Um, and this is what a journey that we're all on. All of us are on this heroic journey. And we see this in so many uh, modern day stories. If you think about it, Star Wars and Harry Potter, the Matrix, Lord of the Rings, Wizard Oz, Karate Kid. Um, our hero or heroine gets a call of some kind, sometimes an unwanted call like a crucifixion experience. And this thrusts them onto a journey. And the journey takes them through many obstacles and ups and downs, facing dragons at every turn, facing villains, whatever it is. And they wander through the wilderness for a time. And then finally um, are victorious at the end. They emerge victorious, rising up and conquering whatever it was they were facing during that time. And what these stories remind us, this is real important for us to, to get. The Easter story, all these stories remind us that what seems to be insurmountable in our lives, whatever that may be for us, can be overcome. This is the good news for us. We can rise up from a crucifixion experience and become so much more. But is that the end of the story? You know, are we there yet? Have we arrived? And uh, when we reach that promised land, are we complete? Are we done? And the answer is, you know, not likely, not likely. In this world of sequels, it seems the story ends. And as much as we would like to sort of tie a nice bow on it, on this adventure, and say we're complete, kind of put it on a shelf, um, it doesn't happen that, that way. We, we can't uh, just say we're done now. It turns out this journey of transformation never ends. It is ongoing. In fact, Jean Houston uh, refers to myth as containing the greater story that never was, but is always happening. The greater story that never was, but is always happening. It's always happening. We don't emerge from the tomb permanently risen, unfortunately. Those pesky crucifixions have a way of showing up again and again in our lives. And after this adventure of overcoming, 
we might return home, but there is more work to be done. We return with new insights, new understandings, an expanded vision of who we are and what we can do. We arrive back with a greater capacity to be who we've come here to be. And we have to bring that into our world. Now we have to apply all that we've learned to our day by day living, as you heard, and after enlightenment, the laundry, which is a, a rendition on the, uh, the ancient truth after uh, enlightenment chop or before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water after enlightenment, same thing, chop wood, carry water. But we're not the same person doing the action. You see, we do it from a different consciousness and but our work continues. We have to bring it down into the world and be the change that we're looking at. And so, so let's take a closer look at this heroic journey with an eye for some clues that might um, help us to discover what we can learn from it. This journey begins with a call of some kind, or what the Jungian analyst James Hollis calls a summons of the soul. Just feel how that feels, a summons from the soul. And he wrote this, to engage with the summons of the soul um, is to step into the deepest ocean, uncertain whether we're able to swim to a distant shore. You see, it sets us out onto a journey into the unknown. It takes us beyond what we know. And so it can be, you know, ex experience this call as a kind of a divine discontent. You know what that feels like, a sense that there's more to life, a realization that en endless addictive striving outside of ourselves for satisfaction is futile, like they say here. I'm not sure how many cookies it takes to be happy, but so far, it's not 27. We, we discover that in this endless striving outside of ourselves to find satisfaction, it just doesn't get us there. For all, as Dr. Hollis points out, if the soul could be so easily bought, our culture would be happy. You know, our culture would work. We'd all be ecstatically happy with our lives. And as we look around the world, we see that's not the case for many in our culture as well as in other cultures. So this summons of the soul can be felt as this divine discontent that there's more to life, but it can also come as a crucifixion experience, a loss of some kind that propels us reluctantly into change. You lose your job through downsizing, a long time relationship ends, a loved one dies, divorce, illness. Sometimes we're thrust into this journey through unwanted change. Dorothy's house flies out of Kansas. Luke Skywalker loses his aunt and uncle and goes into hiding. Frodo is forced to leave the Shire before the ring falls into the wrong hands. And all of these heroes were reluctantly um, forced into leaving their normal life. But we can also choose to transform. You know, we can set out on this journey by choice. If someone offers us the red pill, as they did with Neo and the Matrix, and we find ourselves at a choice point. Either I take this red pill and guess what's gonna happen? I'm gonna leave the comforts of unconscious living. I'm gonna leave the comforts of unconscious living. Or I can take that blue pill and just go right back to sleep. So um, one way or the other, we leave the comfort of our present consciousness for parts unknown. And however this shows up, this summons of the soul, it's a calling forth of a deeper dimension within us. It's asking us to become more of who we truly are, our essential self. And instead of getting more in order to prove our value and worth in some way, it's about being more, being more. Not in any kind of striving to improve or fix ourselves, but in an awakened expression of the truth of who we are already. It's a journey of the heart. It's a quest to awaken more fully to who we've come here to be and to, and to why we're here, you see. And this is so exciting to me to be on this journey. Bill Moyers, in his interview with Joseph Campbell, asked him if he still believed that we as a species, that humanity is participating in one of the greatest leaps of human spirit. And this is what he answered. 
the greatest ever, the greatest ever. So we might think of this journey as a solitary one, but I got to say, I think it's really up for us as, as humanity right now. We're all being called. In fact, Matthew Fox calls this time a dark night of the species. And I believe he's correct with that. However, the dark night has great potential for evolutionary change if we answer that call. And here's the good news. We don't take this journey alone. We don't have to do it all by ourselves. As that call is answered in many of these mythic stories, there's kind of a ragtag group drawn together whose members end up contributing in some way. And this unlikely band of heroes appear to be in a losing battle. It looks like nothing can overcome this, uh, an unbeatable foe, it seems. And yet, by showing up little by little, step by step, each offering their gifts, they emerge victorious in the end. So even if we think that we are um, weak and powerless, I got to tell you, nothing could be farther from the truth. Nothing. Every one of us has the ability to overcome whatever is happening in our lives. We're all valuable characters in our personal as well as the universal story. Um, especially in these times when what's been held in the shadow of our collective, you know, unconscious as humanity, what's been held in that shadow, well, it's, it's up and roaming around. I mean, have you noticed this? There's, there's some stuff going on out there. And, and so for us, we want to really look at this. There are others who have made this journey who can help to guide us in our quest. So who do you consider your spiritual heroes? Who do you turn to? Who do you learn from? Who do you emulate? Who's the trailblazer for your spiritual journey? Maybe your heroes are iconic figures, Jesus, Mother Mary, Buddha, Krishna, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saraswati, the Dalai Lama. Those are some of mine. Or maybe they are authors and teachers, um, Byron Katie, Ernest Holmes, Brene Brown, Oprah, um, Eckhart Tolle, Charles and Myrtle, Tara Brock. Thich Nhat Hanh, Edwin Gaines, or perhaps it's larger than life fictional characters, you know, Jean-Luc Picard, Yoda, Trinity, Mr. Spock. It could also be someone you personally know and admire. So think about all the spiritual heroes who have been a part of your awakening journey, soulful people who have overcome obstacles and spark inspiration in you, learning, understanding a deeper awareness of who you are. Who are those heroes for you? Who can you uh, follow? Because these, um, these heroes, they can't take the journey for us, but guess what? They can mirror for us what our own internal gifts are, and they can aid us along the way by leaving breadcrumbs and sharing signposts. And that's really good news for us because guess what? We're gonna need them for the second phase of this journey. And that is, the wandering. So after answering this call, we do some wandering in the wilderness, also called liminal space. It's the goo phase of the caterpillar to butterfly transformation. It's no longer a caterpillar, not yet a butterfly, but it's goo of imaginal cells. And this in-between is very poignant. And in these stories, that in-between time can range from, you know, three days, whether it's in the tomb or the belly of the whale, to 40 days and 40 nights in the ark, to 45 days under the Bodhi tree, to years of wandering in the desert, 40 years. Whatever the amount of time, what that means metaphysically is as long as it takes. We just have to keep going through it until we're through it. You wander until you don't. But the wilderness is when the most potent transformation can happen. This wandering is a pilgrimage of sorts, one that takes us beyond the comfort zone of our present structure of knowing, you know, beyond our limited belief systems, our, our false identities, beyond the boundaries of our yesterday self. That's where this can take us in this wilderness time. So 
Suffice it to say, there is usually a time lag between setting out on the journey and reaching the promised land. And it is in this time of the wilderness that things can look the bleakest to us. You see that the foe can seem insurmountable. We can be looking at this giant um, mountain that we have to climb, success, nowhere to be found. And it's in the very time when we need to keep our vision alive that it can be very easy to lose the faith. Take the Israelites, for instance. They finally escape the clutches of slavery in Egypt and off they go to find the promised land and they wander and they wander and they wander some more. In fact, here's uh, Moses just kind of catching a glimpse of what he's gotten himself into here. You know, 40 years, that can't be right. <laughs> Something wrong with his GPS. And in the midst of all that wandering, what happens? They start to murmur. We should have stayed in captivity. At least we had food, you know, at least we knew the routine. Now everything's so different and we just want it to go back to the way it was. This can happen to us when we're kind of wandering in that wilderness time. We forget it's a pilgrimage to the soul and we can instead pine away for the way things used to be, for the limitations of our earlier comfort zone, even if we hated it. You know, I. I used to hate that job, but at least I had one, you know, that kind of thinking. And so we can lose our vision during these times. And this is the time when we want to call on our spiritual heroes to guide us and sustain us through this part of the journey. And so we have examples of some of those heroes who purposefully went into the wilderness to face their inner dragons. The Buddha under the Bodhi tree had the demon Mara show up to mess with him. You know, Jesus, of course, uh, went to the desert to face his temptations. And then the desert fathers and mothers were called into the Egyptian desert to face themselves, their temptations, their attachments, their desires, their cravings. And through the internal overcoming that happens by facing those things, they were reborn into a new world of freedom, but they had to do the inner work to get there. Because this heroic uh, struggle, it's, of course, an internal one. It's always that. So our time in the wilderness is when we face our inner villains. You know, there's um, the Judases, the Darth Vaders, the dragons within us. And we can ask ourselves that question. When have I been Judas in my life? When have I been betraying the Christ within me? When have I been Judas? When, what's my internal Darth Vader? Maybe not destroying planets, but just maybe destroying my own hopes and my own dreams. What kind of addictive behavior has my inner dragon been fueling? What kind of the critical voice of that dragon? What, what am I listening to? And so it's a reckoning with our own shadow. And it involves integration of those parts of ourselves that we have orphaned or betrayed or abandoned in some way. And this is the journey, and it's, it's not for the faint of heart. You know, as the Buddha um, is, uh, is said to have written, uh, it's about overcoming ourselves rather than another. That takes a lot more. <laughs> to conquer oneself is the greater task than conquering another. So the truth is that whatever remains unconscious in our psyche actually owns us. So our work is to uncover what we consider the villains inside of us, those parts we have deemed unacceptable and banished you know, out of our conscious awareness and then welcome them back into the fold. This is really important for us to get. In this wilderness time, we face our own inner demons and we have to learn to embrace them and bring them into our conscious awareness. And in so doing, we can now integrate this unconscious shadow material that, that has been lurking beneath the surface. That is one of my favorite pictures of the, the princess and Darth Vader. This is, this is what it looks like, integration. That's what it looks like. When we're doing this integration work, we're doing our inner laundry, you see. And it's a journey to awakening that helps us to put our unfinished business from the past to rest. It's this integration work. And so the good news is, yes, those villains are in there, but so are the heroes. We have the, the energy of the heroes within us. So we want to tap into our inner 
you know, Luke Skywalker gifts in the overcoming of our obstacles. And you may remember that Luke did not uh, vanquish uh, Darth Vader by killing him. He used the force, which is love. And, and if, if you hear nothing else today, this is what we want to get to is the power of love. It's all about that. I love Catherine Ponder and paraphrasing what she said, love your way through life rather than battling it. And love will reveal its secret power. That is the key to this whole thing for us. Through the secret power of love and compassion, kindness, self-acceptance, eventually we find ourselves at the end of the wilderness period. You see, we reach the promised land. We get there. It's a time of rising up. It's an emergence of something greater, an awakening to our evolutionary growth, a deeper understanding, a recognition of ability that we didn't even know we had. It was always there, but it becomes apparent to us when we reach this part in our, in our journey of evolution, you see. There's a saying that's a cliche saying that human beings are like tea bags. We don't know our own strength till we're in hot water, but it's the truth. It really does. Uh, tell us this, that when we go through these wilderness periods, we discover the depths of who we are. And then we want to become the change that we seek. We rise up in that moment to rejoice, to celebrate. The dragon is no longer a threat. The ruby slippers got you home. Darth Vader's left the building. The Christ has risen. But it doesn't end there. <laughs> we now bring our awakened awareness back with us into everyday life, becoming a beacon for others who are also hearing this call to become more. And, the, and then the evolutionary journey begins anew. This week, I spoke to someone who told me a story about when he was going to college, that he took a job as a custodian in the school to help him pay his way through college. And his classmates were appalled that he was in the school at night cleaning up after everybody. But he said that became for him a beautiful spiritual practice every night, that as he cleaned um, each desk, he, he was grateful for every person that sat at that desk and the work they did and blessed them and you know, just turned into this love fest that he did all throughout the school. You know, everything that he cleaned, he was grateful and humble and, um, and blessing whoever was dealing with that. And I thought how wonderful to have someone clean for you like that. Can you imagine having a cleaner come into your house and do that? Bless everything about you as they're doing it. And it reminds Brother Lawrence. If you remember, Brother Lawrence found ecstasy in the pots and pans. <laughs> and so... <clears throat> That's the work. As I heard him tell the story, I realized that's the work right there. That when we reach the promised land, what helps us to get there is an increased capacity to love. And if we start with ourselves. It takes self-compassion, kindness towards ourselves, self-love, self-acceptance, all those things we have to shine from within ourselves to help us move out of the, the wilderness period. And now that we've re reached the end of this journey, now we have to use that increased capacity to love. It's like exercising our you know, kindness muscle. And uh, that's where we have to get with because we want to bring that love, that, that new capacity to love into the world. And doesn't our world need it right now? Doesn't our world need it right now? So what part of the heroic journey are you living right now? Are you getting the urge to become more restless, divinely discontent, you know, feeling like your soul is calling you to something greater? Have you had a crucifixion experience of some kind and through a loss and find yourself kind of stuck in that liminal space? facing your fears, feeling like this is never going to end? Or are you stepping through the threshold, having increased your capacity to love into the promised land? Well, guess what? Wherever you find yourself in this journey, here's what I want you to get. You are the hero or the heroine of your life. 
you have within you all that you need to grow and expand and become more. And with these um, resources that we have of compassion and kindness and caring, using these as our rocket fuel, you can tap into that secret power to help you awaken to a greater expression of who you are and who you've come here to be. And then after rising up in that new awareness, remember, it's time to embody it and bring it forth in your everyday life. After enlightenment, the laundry. And so it is. And so I want to just invite us to take a moment and go into our hearts to that place of loving kindness. I'm just going to invite us all to really practice loving kindness as we enlarge our capacity to love. I love what you said earlier that part of what your community is about is striving to live in oneness. And this is how we do it. Yeah, this is exactly how we do it. Striving to live in oneness is all about keeping that loving energy from within us growing and expanding beyond, you know, our yesterday self. So I'll invite us all to just take a breath. Let's take a breath. And relax. And so if you're sitting down, <clears throat> just feel how that feels to be supported by the chair or wherever you find yourself. And let's set aside any thoughts or cares or worries of the day. And become totally present to this time, this place, this space. And this divine connection that we have with each other and with spirit. We're all divinely connected. We're all on this journey together. And as we learn to love and support one another, we feel that love and support within ourselves. And so we begin to follow the breath as it moves in and out of the body. Now just imagine you're breathing right into your heart space. You can put your hand on your heart if you choose to help you connect with that center of your body. And as you breathe into your heart space, bring into your awareness someone that you deeply love. Someone who, when you think about this person, it makes your heart warm. For me, I just have to think of any of my grandchildren and that starts, it starts the whole thing up. So as you keep this person in your heart, let that feeling of love grow as it warms your heart, as it expands beyond your heart. As it radiates throughout your body, every cell of your body alive with this healing vibration of divine love. And we continue to let that feeling activate from within our hearts and radiate now beyond our bodies. Imagine sending loving kindness to this person that you deeply love. Just feel that connection from heart to heart. Now we let our heart expand even more. 
as we imagine sending forth this love to someone that we feel neutral about. Could be the clerk in the grocery store or acquaintance or neighbor. Choose someone that you feel neutral about and now let that loving kindness go from your heart to theirs. Just imagine seeing their face light up as they receive this unexpected blessing from you. Now we choose someone that maybe challenges us. Someone not so easy to send that love to. Notice how that feels to breathe into your heart, to let that loving kindness continue to rise up and radiate and imagine sending it to this person who is a struggle for you to send love to. And again, notice their face lighting up in surprise. Now we take a breath and we let that feeling radiate and radiate beyond our bodies once more. And we send it throughout our planet to all those places in the world that is in need of compassion and kindness and caring. All those who are struggling, our fellow human beings. And we create together a coherent energetic field of loving kindness. Now we bring that energy back into our own heart with self love, self compassion, self acceptance self-forgiveness, let your heart overflow in gratitude for this healing presence, knowing that as each one of us becomes a vehicle for divine love to be expressed in this world, we are bringing our whole self into the healing of this planet. And for this opportunity to be the expression of oneness in action, we are grateful. And so it is. <laughs>